We continue with Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, and that is a very famous uh, verse, um, and it says the following, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So far, the book of Hebrews has been leaning heavily on the Old Testament scriptures, or the scriptures, as that was all that was known uh, at the time that uh, this epistle was written. Uh, and so the Hebrew audience was familiar with these scriptures. And so in continuation of the previous text, the case is now made that none of this can be denied because of the power of the word. It says here, it's living and powerful. It exposes our weaknesses, our unbelief, as it did to the Israelites, and by extension to us. We spoke about that the last time. And so, the word demonstrates its power, its sharpness, its accuracy. It is alive, and so much more uh, than just an educational uh, text. And I want to go over a few examples of um, the power of God's word. Um, I try to go quickly over them. Um, first, it has healing power. We can read about that among many other places, of course, in Psalm 107, verse 20, where it says, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And then in... Um, Psalm 119, verse 9, we read that the word has cleansing power. It says there, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And the answer comes, By taking heed thereto according to thy word. And um, Paul uh, reiterates that in uh, Ephesians 5, verse 26, where he says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word sanctifying and cleansing power. Uh, the word also keeps us from sin, that we read in Psalm 119 verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Also it counsels us. Same Psalm, verse 24, Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. And again, the same Psalm, verse 28, we read that the word also strengthens us. It says, My soul melteth for heaviness, strengthen thou me according to thy word. And in, again, the same Psalm, 119, verse 165, we read that God's word gives peace. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The word also has um, authority against demonic powers. We read about that in Luke 4, verse 36, where it says, And they were all amazed, and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. The word is also essential to eternal life. We read that in John 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And in John chapter 1, verse 1, we read that the Word even is Jesus himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We need the Word also to build our faith. We read it in Romans 10, verse uh, 17, where it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and by hearing the Word of God. And lastly, in this uh, list of examples, although there are many more to be found, in Ephesians 6, verse 17, we, we read that the word also is a spiritual weapon. It says there, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword 
of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And it's, uh, as has um, been said many times, it's the only offensive weapon. And there's always an easy way to remember this, at least in English, eh? the sword, if you take of the S, you, you have word. So, the word is the sword of the Spirit. The word um, has many, um, many uh, characteristics. It is indeed powerful very powerful and uh, here in Hebrews 4 verse 12 it's compared with a two-edged sword and um, that of course uh, um, supposes that there are also um, single-edged swords and that's actually often the case where, where there is one blunt thick edge to give the sword its strength and then uh, one uh, sharp edge but a a two-edged sword has two sharp edges and has its strength, its thickness in the middle. So that also gives it a very sharp point because it, it, um, it goes to two sharp edges instead of to one blunt edge. God's word also does not have blunt sides either. And the point of the sword is with which you pierce and that's how the word pierces us it both pierces and it divides it cuts when it comes in it comes in deep deep into the heart of man it will wound the heart and cut the conscience that is the picture here and the focus of the word is on the inner man not on the outer man the, uh, the outer man is often uh, described as the flesh or the body. But here it speaks about the, um, the soul, um, soul and the spirit, and that is the inner man. The soul is actually the individual spiritual being uh, that we are, uh, the part of us that actually lives on after this life, whereas the spirit is the life that God blew uh, into Adam's nostrils as we read, read in Genesis so that he became a living soul that spirit is what animates our body that gives us life um, that um, uh, that spirit that is that it speaks about here is not the Holy Spirit it's our own spirit the spirit of life you can say and that has two sides. In Greek, uh, we have two words. We have the word psyche, uh, from which we get, of course, psychology. And we have the word pnevma. Um, so psyche is man's relation to himself. Uh, so his feelings, emotions, thoughts, how he deals with himself. That's the psyche. And whereas um, pnevma is man's relation to God. So you see already that psyche is... Is focused on self. It serves self, and actually, I, I will put up this picture, a picture that I um, also have in this uh, little book that I wrote, um, "Forget Everything." That, by the way, you can download as a free ebook from the website. I'll leave the link for that in the description. Um, but um, I explain it there also a bit further. This relationship between um, spirit, flesh, soul, uh, and the Holy Spirit, uh, how all this works together. Uh, so, but psyche serves self, the flesh, where, whereas pnevma is man's relation to God. Now we have to put God between quotation marks because it's something different for, for different people. Uh, it's this, um, this built-in awareness that man has for something higher. For spirituality. Many people are spiritual or have a form of spirituality, but they don't know God, they don't know Jesus. Um, so uh, there is often this, the, uh, this search for this spirituality um, yeah, ends up in, in a different direction. Um, and that different direction create, is, is, for example, the, the d divine self, eh, as you hear in the New Age, the higher self. Um, that's this form of godliness that Paul uh, writes about in his epistle to Timothy, uh, but at the same time denying God. 
Um, and we see that in the natural man, both the psyche and pneuma are, um, are centered to, uh, to self. Um, we are, by nature, rather self-centered beings, actually. Um, so we are based on feelings. Eh? As long as you feel happy, eh? or, or what you hear a lot, of course, nowadays, is you can be whatever you feel. Uh, and we, we should never offend people because we can't hurt their feelings. That is like the, the biggest sin uh, that exists in the world, uh, so it seems. And, um, and the, the, the slogan of um, Satanism is also, uh, do as thou wilt, do what you want. You, you reign, your, your own God. That's, of course, the original lie that we read in Genesis uh, from the serpent's mouth to Eve. So we see that even spirituality nowadays is, is fake. It's uh, aimed at the divine self, uh, or it's aimed at false, uh, non-convicting uh, religions. It's the form of godliness, but it's denying God. But the word of God, that will cut right through this. And if we allow God's spirit to enter in, then God's spirit will take control over our own spirit and now the balance between flesh and soul and our own spirit will be restored and uh, we will begin not to serve self but to serve God and our soul will be preserved for eternal glory in his presence so there is a lot that can be said about this this verse this uh, power of the word that is sharper than a two-edged sword but it continues in verse 13 Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Nothing and no one is hidden from God. He knows our heart, he t touches it, and we will have to give account on how we respond to that touch. All things are naked and opened to him. And I had to think of... Uh, Adam's words when God visited him in Genesis 3 verse 10 and he that's Adam said I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself he hid himself but uh, God found him of course and God knew exactly what he had done um, because the next uh, verse God asks him a rhetorical question a question to which God knows the answer obviously but he wants uh, to hear it from Adam's mouth. And he says, hast thou eaten from the tree? And, um, the, the whole narrative shows that everything is open to him, to God. And certainly also the nakedness of our sins. Now in, in, the, in the Greek text, uh, there is an interesting word used here for open. And that's uh, tetrachiliomena. Tetrachiliomena. And um, that word is only used here in this uh, spot in the New Testament. And um, it's an ancient Greek word uh, that was used in those days for wrestlers who had their opponent in a chokehold. Um, and, and that uh, guaranteed sure victory. Um, and we see, by the way, in, in different of Paul's epistles that he makes comparisons to, to um, the sports of those days. Uh, wrestling, races, uh, things of that nature, um, because it's, it spoke to the people, and I think uh, it's very much the same today. Many people are very much uh, into uh, all kinds of sports. Anyway, uh, so th this word means uh, laying the opponent open and overcome him. There is no chance for the opponent to escape, and so that is basically uh, what, what God's word does to us, there's no way to escape. And um, we have to remember that the context here is uh, the, for the Hebrew reader to make clear that they cannot give, uh, give up on Jesus. Uh, they can't reject or neglect him. They can't deny the truth of, of scripture, of their own scriptures, by all means. And... Um, the more so now that their hearts 
are pierced and their consciences cut by the power of the word. So instead of denying, instead of turning away, instead of rejecting uh, or neglecting, instead of that, they have to, and we, all of us, we have to surrender. Surrender your heart and enter into his rest, of which we spoke the other time. We see, I said it also last time, I think, in the book of Hebrews, continuously this, uh, this wave motion where there is um, a theme that is shown from Scripture, uh, undeniably, and then it is linked to Jesus and shown that if you know this and you do, and if you believe this and you do, then you have to accept Jesus, the truth of Jesus. And the theme goes between several um, uh, parallels uh, like the exodus and, and one other is um, jesus being the high priest and so now here it moves back to jesus the high priest um, and it is in verse 14 where it says seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our profession now in the in these first chapters of the book of hebrews Paul is very scarce by mentioning Jesus by name. Actually, in the beginning, he, he goes completely around it, but he names all his characteristics as being the Son of God, being the, uh, above the angels, being made lower than the angels, becoming a man, but being greater than, uh, than all the prophets, than Moses, uh, etc. Uh, and he also called him already a high priest um, in, um, in chapter 2, verse 17, and chapter 3, verse 1. Here he goes a bit deeper, and now he says it fully. Eh? He is the great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. There should not by now be no doubt about who he is. But in this verse he mentions also three attributes that cannot be given to any other high priest. No other high priest was called great. Here Jesus is called great high priest. And um, no other high priest passed through the heavens. And no other high priest is the Son of God. So seeing all this, that's the conclusion here, let us hold fast to our confession or our profession. He continues in verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. All the earthly high priests were mere men. They had the same weaknesses as everybody else, and they suffered along with them. And the prime example is, of course, the first official high priest, which was Aaron. Uh, and we know, of course, the golden calf in, uh, incident in the desert, which shows, uh, showed a major flaw in um, Aaron's um, obedience to God and holding up this holy office of high priest. But because of these flaws, all the earthly high priests could sympathize with the men for whom they were um, the mediator. And so it could be argued that Jesus cannot be our eternal high priest because he is the, God, the Son of God says even in, in verse 14. Uh, so um, he was sinless. So how could he sympathize with, with men? And we talked, of course, about it already uh, last time because the point was already made uh, before this. But um, although it was said that he was made a little lower than the angels, he was still the son of God. How does this work? Here it is made clear that he can sympathize with us. Um, that he actually set aside his deity and um, took upon him uh, hum uh, humanity. Um, and so much so that, as it says here, he was in all points tempted like as we are. In all points, not in some areas, in all points. Yet he was without sin. And the word sympathize here... The word that is translated with sympathize actually literally means to suffer along with. He suffers along with us. And that is, that is a great thing if you think about it. 
And so, yeah, as I said, we, we already touched on this in chapter 2, verse 18, where it says he had uh, suffered being tempted, yet he never sinned. And that, that does not mean that um, because he never sinned, he can sympathize less with us. On the contrary, if he would have sinned, he would have been hardened by it, like all of us. And he would less be able to sympathize in a gentle and loving way and in a compassionate way. He would have lost actually the perfection of his nature. Yes, he can sympathize with our weaknesses and with our temptation. But he cannot and he will not sympathize with our sin. There is the crucial difference. Then, verse 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. All this is not just uh, to, to show off how great God is, how well he is, uh, but uh, it leads to this invitation. Because of this, we can come boldly to the throne of God, because we have such a high priest, we are invited to the throne of grace. It does not mean that we can approach with arrogancy, but with reservation. He is, God is, directly approachable. We do not need any other mediator other than God, than Jesus. Not Mary, not saints, not priests, nothing. It's Jesus only. He is sufficient. And the throne of God is here called throne of grace. But it says something else. The throne of grace where we obtain mercy. Both grace and mercy. So mercy is not getting what we deserve. And grace is getting what we do not deserve. Although they often go together and they're closely related, they are uh, different actually. Moreover, it says that he provides grace in time of need. He knows when we are in need of what. He knows it better actually than we do ourselves. And he provides grace in time of need. The finished work on the cross has satisfied the judgment of God on our sins. And um, that brings righteousness or grace and there is this wonderful verse with which i want to to, to conclude from psalm 85 in which, of which we spoke um, of um, in the past um, where where this is beautifully put together in a very poetic way um, psalm 85 verses 10 and 11 where it says mercy and truth have met together righteousness and peace have kissed each other Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. We have these two elements, this mercy and um, grace, uh, or righteousness. It speaks about truth that springs up out of the earth. And um, when we went through our study of uh, the tabernacle, we looked at this, that it really points to the cross here. The cross that is planted in the earth. It touches the earth, but it points up to heaven. It springs out of the earth, and, but ri and righteousness looks down from heaven. The cross is really the bridge between mercy and truth, between righteousness and peace, as it is uh, put here in this so poetic way. And um, in, the, uh, in the tabernacle, all this comes out perfectly because... The cross is there actually represented by the um, altar of burnt offering the, where the sacrifice is being made. The sacrifice is being made on the cross. Uh, but we saw that there is a direct relation between um, the altar of burnt offering, the first piece um, of furniture, if you will, that you meet when entering the holy place of the, the, the tabernacle, the outer court. It is linked directly to the, um, um, the Ark of the Covenant, deep into the Holy of Holies, the last um, 
item that was actually only uh, to be approached once a year by the high priest, they are linked. And so um, that is uh, actually the, um, the righteousness that looks down from heaven. That's where the atonement is being made. Uh, so beautiful picture, and uh, yeah, this Psalm uh, 85, verse 10 and 11, um, is really something to uh, to meditate on uh, a bit more. Um, this is what our great High Priest made possible uh, through his sacrifice uh, and through his uh, continuing work as our eternal High Priest and Mediator. Uh, the power of the word proves it. We cannot deny it. We cannot reject it. And we cannot neglect it. We must surrender and embrace this gift of grace. And um, we will continue uh, next time on this um, theme of the high priest. Because it's actually a bit... Um, uh, it gets too little attention because it's thought of as something Jewish or Old Testament, uh, but the, the type, the picture is so strong, so powerful. So we, we actually, Paul here in the book of Hebrews continues on this theme more in depth in the next chapters. And so we will uh, we'll learn more about that. For now, we leave it at this. Amen. Mm-hmm.